Santa Croce in Florence again now. As I said, this was probably begun by Arnolfo de Cambio. Early sources, including Vasari, do give him this credit anyway. One of the most ubiquitous figures in the architecture and sculpture of the late 13th century, he was apparently a pupil of Nicola Pisano and worked on several of the projects associated with both Nicola and his son Giovanni before coming to Florence, where his chief employment was on the cathedral, which we'll hear more about eventually when we get to Brunelleschi. Santa Croce was built for the Franciscans at the opposite end of town from the Dominican church of Santa Maria Novella going up at the same time. The Dominicans and Franciscans shared much the same spiritual outlook, but despite this, they often didn't get along well at all, and the relationship between them sometimes degenerated into something not much different from gang warfare. Here you get a view of the church from Piazza Santa Croce in front, seen of many celebrations, tournaments, and so on, from antiquity to the present day, it's about where the old Roman amphitheater was. The facade is modern, and most critics don't like it. John Ruskin, speaking during one of his many hyperbolic seizures, calls this church as a whole, in fact, the ugliest Gothic church in the world. It may be that it's not the most graceful or beautiful of Italian churches, but if you're interested in Florentine art, especially of the 14th century, there's no place more important. At the back of the cloister, too, you can see the Pazzi Chapel, one of Brunelleschi's most celebrated successes of 15th century. And the refectory at the right has Cimabue's famous crucifix, which we'll see later today. Santa Croce is also a sort of Florentine pantheon where such diverse and celebrated fellows as Michelangelo, Galileo, Machiavelli, and Rossini are all buried. <laughs> Here's the interior now. Apart from Giotto, 14th century Florentine artists are not well known, and they won't get much attention from me, but some of the most important work by people like Bernardo, Dotti, Agnolo, and Tadeo Gatti, Mezzo de Banco, and others is here. And if this class were 20 weeks instead of 10, you would certainly see their work. There are also important examples of sculpture here by later Renaissance artists like Donatello, about whom we will hear a lot in the future. While we see a little more of the interior now, we'll hear a piece of early polyphonic music. You may have noticed that since we were in the Cathedral of Pisa last week, where we heard a Gregorian chant, a lot of the music has in fact been polyphonic, although I haven't really pointed that out. Monophonic music, like Gregorian chant, just has one melodic line, and everyone sings the same words at the same time. Polyphonic music can have many melodic lines, with many different people singing different words all at once. The history of serious polyphonic music is usually said to really begin with the 12th century manuscripts from the Church of St. Marshall at Limoges in France, as we heard last quarter. We also heard then about the celebrated examples by Leoninus and Paratinus, who did their work at Notre Dame in Paris. The Benedicamus Domino, which is called a salutation and concludes the divine office in the monastic service, was often set polyphonically, and this is a 13th century example from an Italian source. <laughs> Now you're looking through the transept with the chapels decorated by the important 14th century artists, including Giotto.
This is the view back through the nave to the west. And looking back to the east at the choir now without the scaffolding in front of it. Now the large cross which you see there is not especially important as these things go, although it is early 14th century, but it's worth noticing in it in any case because the most important early Italian panel paintings are just such things. It is not small and delicate like typical early panels in the Northern Renaissance. This is 12 feet high. As I've mentioned before, it is likely that early Italian panel painters were consciously or unconsciously influenced by the scale and style of wall-covering mosaics and frescoes. The crucifixion, as I've mentioned before too, is rare in medieval art until the 12th century and extremely rare as a life-size subject. The fact that it became so popular in the High Middle Ages, the 12th century through the 14th century, is something it's easier to emphasize than explain. And then its popularity waned again somewhat, and among the greatest works of the 15th century, there are not many figures of Christ on the cross. No, 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 no. In the Uffizi Gallery in Florence now, you can see the so-called Croce dell'Accademia, which is often called the oldest significant Italian panel painting in existence. It was made, significantly, in Pisa about 1180. It's important to notice that although this is the crucifixion, this is not by any means a realistic representation of the suffering Savior with the emotional intensity Giovanni Pisano would bring to the subject a century later. This is a work of art the purpose of which was not to show you what the crucifixion might actually have looked like, but to remind you of the significance of it. We don't know who did this, but he was a contemporary in Pisa of Bananas who took the same approach in his bronze relief, reliefs we saw in the cathedral doors. And it's the basic medieval approach according to which the real purpose of art is as often as not didactic rather than pictorial, to say something rather than to show something. <laughs> It was, in fact, of course, meant to be no work of art in the sense in which we use that phrase at all. It was meant to be, if not actually worshipped in violation of the second commandment, then something very close to that. Its purpose was at least to serve as a focus of worship. Early panel painters seem to have felt that valuable material had to be used to represent a valuable subject, and the extensive use of gold leaf and lapis lazuli required here would, of course, have made any realistic depiction of events all the more difficult. There aren't that many gold and purple things in the world. The use of these episodes from the Passion also reinforces the icon-like quality of the whole panel. <laughs> Another of these early crosses also was made in Pisa and is still there in the San Mateo Museum. It's called Pisan Cross No. 20 and was made about 50 years later than the Croce dell'Accademia. Uh, this one was made around 1230. Here now one could argue that we have something like the suffering Christ, but he really looks more sad than suffering. But I don't want you to get the impression that as we go into the Renaissance, we're going to see Christ's head droop more and more, that we're going to see more and more intense suffering. In the first place, as I've said, the typical 15th century picture is serene and calm with emotional display at a minimum. 
Further, it's very difficult to express true suffering or any feelings within the limits of facial expression and general body language. Most of us get to what is, in effect, our maximum emotional display very quickly over trivial things like parking tickets or lost keys. And I might just say parenthetically that what's true for pain and suffering is also true for happiness. Most people who win a thousand dollars react about the same way people do who've won a million dollars. A painter or photographer can show you yelling something like wowee and throwing your arms up, but after that there's not much more he can do. We have to understand what the subject of a work of art is in as full a sense as possible if we're to understand the significance of the body language and facial expression. It's a challenge for even Rembrandt to convey to us the emotional character of his subject's feelings in the absence of any knowledge on our part about who they are or why they're feeling the way they do. Here's Chimabui's famous crucifixion now. It was probably once on display over the high altar in Santa Croce and is now in the refectory museum. It was one of the major casualties of the 1966 flood, during which it was knocked off the wall and floated in muck for days. It was rescued and restored, though with much paint left missing, and there was some controversy about how extensively it should be repainted, if at all. This picture was taken before the flood. This work is not only famous, it's significant that it is probably more famous than any crucifix painted later in the Renaissance, during which, as I said, few important painters made it a subject for a masterpiece. It is essentially, as far as this can be quantified, of the same emotional character as the work we just saw, but it makes a stronger impression for several reasons. For one thing, the passion vignettes have been eliminated, and so don't distract from the central subject, and for another, it's painted with a much greater attention to anatomical fidelity, even if it still has an icon-like quality. Two other points should be made here as well. One is that the focus of early Renaissance artists is almost exclusively on human beings, or former human beings like saints, and they will be the nearly exclusive subject of Italian art until the end of the 16th century. And another point, early Renaissance painters like Cimabue here are very good at details like hands and feet, but will have a lot of trouble until the mid-15th century successfully putting all the parts of a painting people, buildings, trees, etc., into a convincing whole. In the same room in the Uffizi Gallery, you can see Cimabue's Madonna Enthroned, as well as those by Giotto and Duccio. The Virgin Enthroned, like the Crucifixion, was not a popular subject either until the late Middle Ages, but from the 12th century on, the Virgin herself certainly became perhaps the most popular single subject in Renaissance art, popular out of all proportion to the space she occupies in the New Testament. Traditionally, St. Luke is supposed to have painted the Virgin in a picture preserved in the Church of the Hodegetria in Istanbul, which was lost in the sack of 1453. It's doubtful that Cimabue ever saw this picture, but it apparently represented the Virgin in much this way, according to the format we now usually call the Virgin Enthroned. This subject is even more symbolic or didactic than the crucifixions we've seen, for it represents something which never really happened at all. The Virgin was never seated like a queen on a throne with the baby Jesus, except in visions. This is certainly impressive. Like the early crucifixions, it's big. The Virgin is essentially life-size. But beautiful is probably not a word that comes to your mind. Or if this is beautiful, it is so in the way your mother is beautiful, or the Queen of England, or someone like that, who is, because of her stature, someone to whom you wouldn't deny beauty, but who is really just outside the categories of beautiful and not beautiful altogether. Impressive, rather than beautiful in the ordinary sense, is just what Chimabue wanted this to be.
Cimabue's only well-documented frescoes are in the Church of St. Francis at Assisi, and this is the Madonna enthroned with St. Francis, just a corner of which we saw earlier in the lower church there. It's very similar to the Uffizi picture we just saw, the panel picture, although the coloring has deteriorated to sort of pastel shades, probably, if anything, making the picture more appealing. Cimabue's fresco of the crucifixion upstairs in the transept at Assisi, and this picture has suffered even more deterioration. I wouldn't imagine the pollution level in the air at Assisi to be especially bad, but the claim is that the lead-based paint Cimabue used is combined with sulfur in the air, turning it into a black compound. As a result, we get something like the negative of the original now. One critic, Sarah Limerell, it says this may be the most powerful crucifixion ever painted, in part because of the dramatic look it has taken on as a result of this atmospheric accident. In any case, this, to most observers, conveys much more of the emotional intensity of the event than the more icon-like panel he painted at Santa Croce, impressive as it may also be. <laughs> street now called Borgo Alegre, which leads to Santa Croce, the campanile of which you can see in the distance. This is said to have been the artist's quarter in Cimabue's day. According to tradition, Charles Anjou once paid a visit to the great Cimabue studio, and there was such a festival atmosphere thereby created that the street was known as Happy Street ever thereafter. Maybe, but other sources suggest it was called that because, like artists' quarters in many other cities, it was full of taverns and brothels. Giotto is thought to have been born about here, in the street behind the church of San Lorenzo in Florence. Tradition also says that Cimabue was the teacher of Giotto, who then went on to surpass him in renown, as Dante mentions in a famous passage on fleeting fame in the Purgatorio. And Giotto is said to have lived also here at the corner of Via Pucci and Via Ricasole, just north of the cathedral. This building is easy, easy to identify by the streetside shrine on it, which is of a sort that used to be much more common in the city. Here one could say a quick prayer, make an offering while on the way to work. I guess these sort of functioned like the spiritual equivalent to the instant teller in the 13th century. Because of his fame in his own time, a lot of anecdotal stuff about Giotto survives, which helps round out our idea of his character as a person, as well as as, as an artist. Both Cimabue and Giotto, in fact, seem to have been far from the sort of sensitive spiritual aesthetes we might suppose them to have been. The conception of the painter as eccentric begins pretty much with the history of painting itself. Cimabue, in fact, is a nickname meaning bull-headed, and Giotto seems likewise to have had a prickly side to his character. I don't usually show modern artists' ideas of what ancient artists looked like, but this statue of Giotto in the Uffizi courtyard has always seemed to me to pretty well fit my idea of him. Makes him look more like a plumber than a, an artist, really. But as Boccaccio uses Giotto's appearance to point out, you can't judge a genius by his clothes. You can't judge a book by its cover. He was no artiste with flowing curls and silk robes, and he considered himself perhaps a successful businessman, first of all. He had six lawyers working for him to run down deadbeat clients and made money off clever investments in the weaving industry in between altarpieces. Anticipating Samuel Johnson, a man I imagine to have been of a somewhat similar character, Giotto might well have said, anyone who paints except for money is a blockhead. 
It's not only difficult to judge a man's character from his looks, however, it's difficult to judge an artist's character from his work. This is the Uffizi Madonna made by Giotto for the Church of Ognissanti in Florence. It's in the same room as Cimabue's Madonna we saw a few minutes ago in the Uffizi Gallery, and it is usually considered Giotto's earliest surviving work. Where Cimabue's has a sort of Byzantine Romanesque look to it, largely because of the way the throne is done, Giotto's has a more obviously Gothic quality, certainly in the throne at least. It was clear in Cimabue's work, and it's even more clear in Giotto's, that these early Renaissance artists were trying to make their work look realistic within the limits of what was expected of them by their employers. Giotto was trying to make it look, in this case, as though we were really seeing the Virgin on an actual throne. I'm sure Giotto knew that there was something wrong with the perspective treatment of his throne. He just didn't know how to get it right. Medieval artists, on the other hand, didn't even try to get it right, so they were not conscious of any failure. Within the didactic approach they took, realism just didn't matter. But the fact that Giotto can't give us a globally realistic composition doesn't mean that some of the details aren't perfect. We're still near the very beginning of Italian Renaissance painting. And these angels are as fine as any ever painted. Remember what I said also about the focus of the Renaissance on the human figure. Because these are also very convincing. And although no one in the Renaissance is going to paint a still life as the whole subject of a work of art, the vase of flowers here is a little masterpiece in its own right. This is now the Arena Chapel in Padua, and all authorities agree that whatever else Giotto might or might not have done, including the Assisi frescoes, his real masterpiece is the series of pictures he painted in this building. The building itself is of no particular architectural consequence, but it is one of the first, if not the first, to have apparently been designed with the requirements of a painter in mind. It can be taken to at least symbolically represent the transition from the importance of architecture in the Middle Ages to the greater importance of painting in the Renaissance. In the Middle Ages, painters had to pretty much just adapt to whatever the architect left them. The architecture was almost always the main thing. It was built with the money of Enrico Scrovegni between about 1302 and 1305. Scrovegni had several motives for paying for this. For one thing, his father was notorious enough as a greedy old curmudgeon that Donnie refers to him in the Inferno, and that's to put him in some pretty bad company. So Enrico may have been trying to kind of rehabilitate the family reputation, and also the family finances were entangled in various complicated ways with the church, and some think he hoped the Pope would help him sort this out if something nice like the Arena Chapel were built. Here's Enrico himself as he appears in Giotto's fresco inside. He's presenting the church to the heavenly host, and in this way becomes one of the very first donors to appear in a work of art. He had no children and may also have considered this a sort of legacy by which he might be remembered. It's often called the Scrovegni Chapel, but more commonly the Arena Chapel because it was built into the site of the old Roman amphitheater in Padua, the Arena, as was the Palace of the Scrovegni, but the latter is long gone. Giotto apparently began work here even before the consecration of the church in 1305. Ave Maria, gratia plena, that's the salutation of the angel Gabriel to Mary at the Annunciation, and the church is officially the church of 
Santa Maria Nunziata, you see the interior now, and the Virgin is a primary subject. In the top row of frescoes by Giotto, we have the story of Joachim and Anna, the Virgin's parents. The middle row is essentially devoted to the life of the Virgin and her son, and the lower row illustrates the Passion. The story of Joachim and Anna is not in the Bible. It comes from the Protovangelion of James, an apocryphal, a pseudepigraphal New Testament book written in the 2nd century AD, but Giotto's source was the golden legend of Jacobus de Voragine, the 13th century bishop of Genoa, who compiled what became a semi-official series of popular stories, mostly about post-New Testament saints. This book was an even more important source for artists in the Renaissance than the Bible itself, yet it is much neglected in the atmosphere in which art history today is carried on. An atmosphere in which what a picture looks like is considered more important than the actual subject itself. I'm not sympathetic to this view, so you'll hear a lot about the stories in the Golden Legend from this point on. And the story of Joachim and Annie is one of the most important and most often used. The story goes that since Joachim and Anna had not had any children, the people of Jerusalem assumed the Lord must be punishing them, though they seemed like good people, for some concealed sin. This is a reflection of the basic Old Testament view that the Lord rewards and punishes in this life, not in the next, although by the end of the Old Testament period certainly many Hebrews had begun to question this attitude. There just seemed to be too many bad rich people in any case, Joachim was forced to leave the city, and you see him here asking to spend the night with a couple of shepherds. And in this close-up, you can see that they have some doubts. One of the things for which Giotto is most famous is his subtle use of expression and gesture, and the glance of the shepherds tells it all here. Like all great artists, he was a master of understatement. Giotto drew what he saw, says Leonardo da Vinci. That night, Joachim received his version of the Annunciation. An angel appeared to tell him that, miraculously, his wife Anna is in fact pregnant. As I've said, the focus of the Renaissance is on human beings, and especially in the early Renaissance, very little attention is given to things like landscape background, which Giotto probably regarded as more or less the equivalent to a stage set. When you go to see Hamlet, it's okay to criticize the set, but the important thing is the human drama on the stage. Kenneth Clark, in fact, calls Giotto the supreme dramatist of human life, and that's to pay him quite a compliment. It's important to keep this point in mind, I think. It's the human drama that matters. It's what the people are doing you should focus on, as I say, especially in the early Renaissance, you don't want to let the sort of perfunctory treatment of background distract you too much. And here's the Annunciation to Anna. The story of Joachim and Anna obviously parallels that of Mary and Joseph. Mary's birth is regarded as miraculous, even though it's not as miraculous as that of Jesus. Here you see Anna greeting Joachim on his return at the gate to the city in an embrace of a sort rare in the history of art. This is, as I said, the kind of subtle but often intense emotional expression for which, among other things, Giotto is famous. This, in fact, is just about as emotional as any artist will be in his work for the next century and a half at least. Here's the birth of Mary. As I said, Mary's birth was miraculous, but she was not born of a virgin. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, not officially part of church doctrine until 1854, states that she was born free of the stain of original sin and the consequent propensity to commit sin herself. She's in a different moral class from the rest of humanity. Since she was a beautiful girl, all the rich and handsome bachelors wanted to marry her. 
The high priest was told in a vision that all suitors should bring sticks to the altar and the stick of the chosen bachelor would burst into bloom. Among these fellows, however, is one old gray-haired guy who figured he didn't have a chance, so he didn't bother to turn in a stick. But the others should have been suspicious of him because he has a halo. So here they all sit, waiting for one of the sticks to burst into blossom, but since Joseph, whom you can see there at the back on the left, didn't turn his in, nothing happens. They wait and wait and nothing happens. Finally, he does turn his in, and of course it immediately burst into flower, and he gets to marry Mary. Some of the others took this pretty hard. One's breaking his worthless stick over his knee now. Here's Mary returning to her home, which in the New Testament is said to have been in Nazareth, which was also the home of Joseph. But she better be careful because it looks like one of her house plants has gotten out of control. Natale Regis Gloriae Laetator Celi Curia, on the birthday of the King of Glory, the heavenly court rejoices. Here's the nativity now, and with this episode we do get to more familiar territory in the New Testament itself. The nativity is December 25th, when the shepherds arrive, as St. Luke tells the story. Here you see a detail from Giotto's picture. It's difficult for an artist to make a baby look like a baby and yet still give the impression he could grow up to be the savior of mankind. And Giotto does that maybe better than any other artist in the Renaissance. Epiphany, which you see now, is the arrival of the Magi on January 6th, Twelfth Night as, it calls it, as it's called in England, uh, 12 days later, a separate event in the traditional church calendar. It's the episode from Matthew, and we often just mix them all up together today, and no one pays much attention to Epiphany as a separate holiday. If Walt Disney had had to paint a camel saying, wow, this is what he would have looked like, I think. Giotto really does do some, some charming animals. We've been hearing, prior to the last piece, some instrumental music by Johannes Ciconia, one of the most important Flemish composers who came to Italy to work, and he spent a good part of his career in Padua and was writing music there just about the time Giotto was working in the Arena Chapel, just uh, maybe a decade or so later. They, they could conceivably even have met. And while we see some more of Giotto's work now, on the life of Jesus and the Passion, we'll hear the hymn, O Padua, by Ioannis Jaconia. It is sort of the Paduan national anthem. This is the presentation in the temple, which occurs on the same day as the Feast of the Purification of the Virgin, February 2nd. It was during the episode known as the Wedding at Cana that Jesus performed his first miracle, turning water to wine. And the fellow with the right looks like just the right guy for the taste test. Here Jesus is driving the money changers from the temple. It's an episode you don't see painted that often, but it seems somehow characteristic of Giotto that he would show Jesus punching people out.
this is the Last Supper, and here you see the disadvantage to having to wear a halo to dinner if you sit on the wrong side of the table. That's why this scene will almost always be represented later, like Leonardo does it, for example, with all the apostles on the far side. This is the arrest of Jesus now as he confronts his betrayer eye to eye. The resurrection and the appearance of the Lord to Mary Magdalene. And here she is closer. This is thought to be a self-portrait of Giotto among the saved. The artists of his day apparently often wore the kind of cap he has on here. Okay, we'll finish Giotto's career next time and go on to hear more about the 14th century, and that is the greatest century in the history of Italian literature. So we'll get to Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, among other heroes. <laughs>